Nothing like starting off a conference with AV problems. Um, all right, so sorry about that. Um, well, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. This is my first uh, European debut uh, giving an Ember talk, so I'm really excited about that. Um, I wasn't able to make it out to Emberfest last year, but I'm glad I could make it out this year. So, um, so yeah, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a keynote. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Eric Brin. I've been uh, working on Ember for many, many years now, um, since the beginning, basically. Um, and I've been really lucky. I've been able to uh, spend most of that time doing consulting around Ember. So I've been able to make my living uh, working on Ember and helping people learn and build Ember applications. So um, I consider myself really lucky to have been able to do that for the last three years or so. Um, and so it's interesting. We're actually, um, Emberfest here is occurring uh, pretty uh, close to the one-year anniversary of uh, releasing the release of Ember 1.0. Um, so this was the Ember 1.0 uh, release blog post that was on August 31st, 2013. So it's been just under a year uh, since... We shipped 1.0, and um, for those of you who have been along for that ride, uh, you know that uh, it, we've been working on Ember for a lot longer than that. It's actually been uh, almost three and a half years, and so we spent two and a half years crafting uh, Ember and really, you know, trying to to ship a solid 1.0. And I think we, uh, you know, the last year has shown that we accomplished that. Ember hasn't changed a ton since. Uh, it 1.0 has been released. It still pretty much looks the same, uh, but we've been doing a lot of work to build uh, and improve on top of that base that we've, that we've built for that two and a half years. So like I said, 2014 has been an amazing year, and um, we've actually done seven releases uh, in this year. So we're up to 1.7 today. It was just released last week, um, and uh, also our first beta of 1.8. And so uh, let's talk real quickly. Uh, 1.7, for those of you following at home, uh, includes query params, which has been a uh, much... Uh, <laughs> yes. Give a round of applause to Alex Machnier and uh, uh, also uh, Alex... Where is Alex here? Hey, Alex. Hey, nice to meet you, man. Um, um, uh, and so they, the Alexes have been working on query params for uh, quite some time, and it's finally shipped in 1.7. We're really excited about it. And the other cool thing that uh, we shipped last week was in 1.8 beta, and uh, now we don't have um, any more script tags in our DOM output. So our, we, we changed our data binding library um, to the... Uh, data binding library we built for HTML bar support, we actually were able to get that into 1.8 ahead of the uh, release of HTML bars, and it also is making um, the, uh, the HTML bars merging process a lot easier to get stuff in early and test it ahead of time. Um, so let's take a quick peek at those two features. I just want to show them off. They're really cool. Um, so let's see. Hopefully this will work. <laughs> I'm going to... Whoa. Is that my phone or yours? Um, all right, so now we're mirrored. Uh, hello. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, no. Don't break on me. All right. So let's see here. All right, so let me actually, it should probably, uh, this isn't the greatest setup for doing this. So, here we've just got a simple um, 1.7 app. I will show you in just a bit. All right, so here's just the starter kit um, with Ember 1.7. Uh, and so the way we crafted query params was really to like make it very easy for you to take existing state in your application that you might have and export that to the URL, right? Because Ember is all about uh, the URL being a first-class citizen, 
And we want to make sure that your users, when they re reload the page, they get, end up at the same place in the application that they were before, right? And so the way that we think about query parameters is um, in your application, you might have some kind of state, like, for example, in this really simple example, you're pulling down, uh, you're selecting values in a dropdown, right? And so uh, unfortunately, this state doesn't get captured in the URL at all, right? So there's no actual place that, you know, to, that we store this. So if the user refreshes their browser, that state gets lost, right? So we refresh, and now it, it switches back to red. But the idea that we came with to query params is what we think query parameters are a great place to put these pieces of application state. And so we came up with a uh, nice and simple API for doing that. I'm not going to dive into um, all of the features of query parameters. I'm just going to show you a quick example. But um, you should check out the query params guide on, in the, uh, Ember, the Ember docs. Uh, they're really good. So here is an example of um, our application. We're storing that. Uh, we've got just a select dropdown. And we're storing the selected item in that list in a select color property, right? And so here we can see it's bound into the DOM. And um, so we, in our controller, we'll have a property called select color. And all it takes to now push that data to the URL is to just specify a query parameters uh, configuration in your controller and just provide the name of the property that you want to serialize. So if we go ahead and just do that one liner, go back to our application, now we can see that the selected color is actually stored in the URL now. So if we refresh, we end up with that state. Right? That's all we had to do. That was kind of the, the, the real, uh, you know, the idealistic goal that we had in mind. And of course, um, you know, if you go and edit these values in the URL, the data changes as well, right? And if you hit the back button and the forward button, your application responds. And so the way I'd like to pitch query parameters is it's like two-way data binding to the URL in a way, right? So this is really cool. Um, now, uh, the other thing I want to demo real quick is uh, the elimination of script tags. So if we upgrade to Ember Canary, let's just check, take, a, take a peek here in our inspector. And so if you're familiar with Ember, if you've done this before, you're going to see all these script tags in the DOM. And for those of you who aren't familiar with, for, with this, what, is, what are these things? Well, what this, what this is is it was our mechanism for tracking uh, content that you put into the DOM. So, uh, for example, we've got a select dropdown. We've got a property being bound out into the DOM. We want, when that data changes in JavaScript land, we want to go back in and update that in the document, right? And so the approach that we came up with originally was actually using span tags. And we quickly figured out that span tags weren't acceptable, like they are not valid in every possible context inside of a document. For example, you can't put uh, span tags around like TRs in a table tag, right? So we shifted over to, we figured out that script tags were actually valid in any context of the page. And so we figured out that uh, we could do the same approach using script tag markers. And so here you can see our, uh, our dropdown uh, has also a bunch of script tags around it. So basically, the internal representation of how that um, select uh, component gets built up, there's a bunch of bindings in it. Uh, and so basically, anytime there's a binding in the DOM, you see these script tags surrounding it. So here's the most simple example. You've got that color, right? And it's surrounded by two marking script tags to, that allow us to go find it and replace that content later. And so now, if we go and update to Ember Canary, and refresh the page, you're going to see no more script tags anywhere. And so this is really cool. And so uh, I won't go too heavy into it, but basically the way that this works now is that uh, instead of using script tags, we're actually using text nodes. Uh, and, and we're actually keeping track of regions of uh, the DOM uh, with our binding library. So we know basically like a, you know, content is in between the first and second nodes in this element. And so we track those indexes and, and go in and um, uh, replace that. Uh, and so this was actually something, this was technology, data binding technology that we came up for for HTML bars. 
uh, and we, uh, I should say, Chris Selden on the core team thought had the the wise idea of you know actually backporting it uh, to existing uh, to the existing Ember templating library uh, or templating package, and so. Um, we, had, we get that early, and it also helps with our, like I had mentioned before, it helps us get, uh, it helps us merge code uh, in smaller chunks rather than having HTML bars be like a massive uh, merge. Um, and so this, this data binding code is going to get tested, you know, much sooner than it would have if it, if it uh, sat in a branch, waiting until all of the HTML bars work to get them. So this is really cool. Uh, we're really happy with this. And... Uh, from the Twitter sphere, it sounds like you guys are really happy, and from the, the, the applause as well. So, so this is great. Um, so now let's get back. All right, so. Uh, I've been alluding to HTML bars, and so let's uh, chat a bit about HTML bars. So for those of you who don't know, what is HTML bars? Well, um, basically, well, I should say it's, it's going to be building on top of the work done in 1.8, like I had mentioned. And, uh, but what is HTML bars? Basically, some of the big complaints people had about our templating system was, well, one, the script tags. So we knocked that one out, so that's good. But um, we also don't... Uh, know currently uh, where helpers are being used. And so that necessitated uh, this bind adder helper that you guys are probably familiar with. Um, and so what HTML bars buys us in addition is contextually aware helpers. So we'll know when you're using mustaches inside of an element's attribute definition versus inside of the, uh, the content of that element. There's also a, a big pile of performance improvements that we're working in. Um, we're going to have great SVG support, thanks to Matthew Beal, who's in the crowd and speaking, I think. Um, and uh, we're, it's also enabling us to have an optional jQuery dependency as well. So for those of you who might be building, um, <coughs> you know, or targeting more modern browsers and don't want to pay the file size cost of jQuery, uh, you're not going to have to do that anymore. And so HTML bars has been a long, uh, long work in progress. Um, we're targeting... Uh, hopefully 1.9 beta, which is going to be the next beta series, uh, but it may slip to 1.10. Um, we'll, we'll just have to see what we can do. So um, our goal always with Ember, though, has been to provide, so kind of stepping back, our goal with Ember has always been to provide a really conventional approach to building modern uh, next generation browser applications, right? And so what do I mean by browser application? I mean something that renders completely in the client, um, you know, it speaks to a server purely through APIs and, um, you know, gives you that kind of richness that users have come to uh, expect when they're using uh, applications. And, you know, this is, uh, the, the state of the art has really been pushed by mobile, right? iOS and uh, now Android UIs are really, are really smooth. And, you know, people want responsive uh, and fast web applications as well. So one of the big things that's been hard uh, with adoption is that people have uh, getting started with a real Ember application setup has, has been a hurdle. Um, you know, a year ago, starting an Ember application meant something, you know, there was no really official uh, path towards starting the way that you built an Ember app was clear from a coding perspective, but like how those JavaScript assets got built, how they got deployed, um, was a unknown. It was not a problem space that we were that we were solving, um, and so we kind of waited uh, for solutions to emerge in the community. And we had um, you know things like the Rails. If you were you know using the Rails asset pipeline, you might have been happy in that world. You could have been using a grunt based setup. You could have been using Gulp or, you know, one of these other solutions. But it was basically the, one of the first things you ended up doing when you started building an Ember application was like, how, okay, let me get template compilation set up. All right, I need to do all these things, and now my handlebars templates get compiled, and I don't have just one big index HTML file with a bunch of templates embedded in it, right? And so 
Um, Ember CLI has come to the rescue and uh, via the, way, the ways of uh, Ember AppKit. So um, Ember CLI is basically uh, a project that was started by Stefan Penner on the Ember core team. And he had previously uh, led the Ember AppKit um, effort, which was a grunt-based solution um, to, to this problem. And, you know, learned a lot and kind of rebooted and started on Ember CLI, which has been um, intended to be, you know, to lead to something that could be an official solution to, the, to this problem for Ember application developers. And so, you know, really what we set out, what our dream has always been, uh, would be something like you install a package to get this uh, command, you then you can run an, uh, you know, an Ember, Ember new my app, and then you can just start up the application and you're off coding. You don't have to worry about, you know, the ghetto of JavaScript build tools. Um, and so, you know, uh, another big hurdle uh, has been sharing code as well uh, in the Ember community. So, beca and because of fragmented build tool systems, and there's never been a way to say, you know, there's never been a solid way to say, okay, if you just use X, you can type this one command and now you'll get my library inside of your application and you'll be able to go off and, you know, run, start using it without a lot of configuration. Um, and so uh, we've got experimental uh, support for add-ons with Ember CLI as well. And so I want to show you a little bit uh, of Ember CLI add-ons. And, um, you know, basically just like Ember has conventions for, uh, for writing your code, it would be great for if there were conventions for uh, distributing, it, distributing it and consuming it, right? So let's take the key. So here's just a simple blank Ember app. Uh, All right, so, um, you know, we, you can start off. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to really do it because it takes a while to npm install everything. But if you've installed Ember CLI, you have an Ember command on your, on your machine now. And you can say, you know, Ember new my app. And then it goes and creates all of the file structure that you need for building your Ember application, right? This is the conventional file structure. Um, so you're off to the races. Then it goes and installs all this packages stuff that over conference Wi-Fi is probably going to take forever, so we're going to skip that. Um, but you end up basically with a uh, a directory of you know these generated files, and so this is basically what that looks like. And you can then run Ember serve, and you know you'll have a local development server running at port forty two hundred, and along with that you can also get an Ember um, build command. And so you run this, and this is actually going to build up all of your assets and package them into a dist folder that you can then go drop onto your CDN or, you know, package into your backend app or whatever, right? The way that to think about this is Ember applications are basically just a bunch of static assets, right? Because they're completely client-side rendered, um, you know, so this is something that, you know, in my ideal deployment setup, you just throw up on S3 and you know, you tend to have to do a little bit of magic to get the index page uh, in the right place. But, um, and then, you know, there's also the idea of, you know, hey, what if there was an Ember deploy command? I, this doesn't actually exist right now, uh, but uh, you can actually, there are add-ons I've seen actually recently that make this exist, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so, uh, actually, I, and I believe last time I looked at this, I think somebody might have done something with deploy. Uh, but I don't know, maybe, maybe I was smoking something. Um, the other big thing here is that if you're, if you're, you know, a newbie and you're getting off and running, um, you know, you, you might need like help generating files, right? You might not know the conventional file structure or you want, might want the ability to, you know, have a very Rails-esque experience of saying like, hey, generate me a controller and then automat and then it would automatically generate you some test, your test uh, file as well, so you you know you don't have to do that manually yourself. So uh, Ember CLI also has generators as well, and there's a whole bunch of other fun, fancy features like 
you know, it has environments. So if you have different behavior and development and production, you have a you have a standard way of configuring your application. So those things exist. So, um, anyways, that's a quick aside about Ember CLI. But basically, the hope was right. It's easy to create a new. It's easy to install Ember CLI to create a new Ember application. But it's not. What about the sharing code problem? Well, um, ideally, it should be as simple as uh, a one-line command. And so there is actually um, a uh, whoops. Let's see here. So I found this Ember add-on that somebody had published. Uh, it's called Ember CLI Date Picker. Um, and so I can just npm install this package, um, and hopefully this will work. Uh, should have been cached. There we go. Great. Um, and so now this has been installed into my Ember application. And the promise here is that I should just be able to go into my code and drop in, like, just start using this thing, right? And so if you had went and looked at the documentations for this uh, add-on, it turns out it adds a date picker component. And so I can just go into my, Ember te my, my application template or whatever template in the application that uh, this belongs in, and oh, I need to run the dev server, so Ember serve. Um, I should be able to just go in, drop this in, and now I have a date picker usable inside of my application. Right? This was this is like the next, you know, uh, evolution of what we can do by having uh, not only a conventional JavaScript framework, but also conventional tools for developing these conventional applications. Right? And so <clears throat> I'm really excited to see um, what comes of this. It's very early on uh, in the effort, but Hopefully, it's it's obvious and clear to you guys uh, how valuable this is going to be to the community once it's all fleshed out. So, um, so like I said, um, so as I've kind of been alluding to, I I envision Ember CLI as an enabler, right? This is something that is going to enable us to do things that not and just any other uh, JavaScript framework or set of libraries are going to be able to do because we are able to be more prescriptive, right? We can control more of the experience and, and do more. So um, what, an example of this is modular application builds. And so um, we want to be able to you know, build in features into Ember, but if you don't want to use them, then ideally that code should not end up in your built application. Right, so the idea of uh, this is kind of the idea of ending the like file size wars because the idea is you don't have to worry about how much code is inside of Ember. What you just worry about is what you've used inside of Ember, right? And so um, with Ember CLI, we have the ability to you know have the uh, the build system actually just you know do a static analysis on the modules or whatever that you're using in your application, and then only pull those things from Ember that you actually use, right? And so that's going to be great for people that are building mobile applications, for example, or you know, you, you want to get down your, your ultimate application build size. Um, and then a similar kind of related idea is the idea, uh, something we've kind of been chatting as it's been termed uh, lazy loading. And so this is kind of similar to the, to the modular application build, except this is actually you might have a very, very large Ember application, and when somebody goes and, uh, and it does initially boots it, they, you know, they navigate to the application's URL, you might not want to send all of the application's source code down to the user. You might want to only send uh, the, you know, like a common set of code and whatever code is required to, for that specific route that they have navigated to, right? And so you can imagine when uh, with a conventional build tool system and a conventional framework, we can actually have Ember be smart enough to know what part of the application you're in, and then when you navigate to another part of the application, it can go and load a targeted set of compiled assets only, you know, that only contains the stuff that is needed for that place that you're navigating to, right? And so these are the kinds of things we have in mind and we would love um, to, you know, implement as well. And Another, uh, another big and important uh, thing is it enables us to bring new JavaScript language features to the Ember community as well. And so if you're familiar with Ember CLI already, or even Ember AppKit before it, um, you've, you've seen that 
we have adopted ES6 module syntax uh, pretty early, right? ES6 modules aren't actually... Uh, so for those of you who don't know, ES6 modules are basically a, a new standard uh, way of having, you know, modular code inside of uh, the JavaScript language. So it adds new additional syntax for importing and exporting things from JavaScript files. And, um, you know, prior to that, existing solutions that you're probably familiar with are CommonJS or AMD, right? And so what we've been able to do um, with Ember CLI is actually have a uh, ES6 module transpiler built into the development tools. And so you can actually start, we can have Ember developers start using new features uh, that are going to, you know, and, and help future-proof their application code today um, before those features actually exist inside of browsers. And so what I'm referring to here is something that I like to call transitional transpilation. And um, the idea is that these there's a lot of new features, exciting features coming to the JavaScript language, but um, as we're all aware of, it, we don't get to use any of these new features until they actually exist inside of browsers. Um, and uh, we've unfortunately had to, uh, we, you know, so we've worked around these kinds of things uh, before, uh, you know, if you've used CoffeeScript, right? Like CoffeeScript has a bunch of great language features, and it was ba it's a transpiled language, right? It gets transpiled down to JavaScript. So the idea of what we can do here with ES6 is uh, the upcoming uh, JavaScript standards are we can actually transpile those new those new syntaxes and those new features into uh, you know syntax that is compatible with today's browsers. So uh, in the in the um, context of uh, Ember CLI today, that means ES6 modules. Um, but in the very near future, that might mean additional ES6 features. And so you can actually start doing this today with Square's ES Next project. This is basically kind of, you can envision this, uh, well, the way that I describe this project is an X coffee. Uh, so a, uh, I personally used to use CoffeeScript, uh, and I actually worked uh, with my buddy Brian, who, who wrote ES Next at Square. Um, and he was a big CoffeeScript proponent. But today now, with all these new uh, syntaxes and features in JavaScript language. There's, it's ES Next is really a ex CoffeeScript aficionado's solution to how he can get his team that is writing CoffeeScript today to start writing just plain old JavaScript uh, instead. And so that means bringing in great features that exist in these specs that may or may not be implemented in in browsers yet, but can get transpiled over into compatible syntax today. And so this is actually pluggable into Ember CLI via an add-on. Uh, so Robert Jackson on the core team actually wrote an Ember CLI ES Next uh, add-on. So you can actually start using some other new features other than uh, ES6 module syntax in Ember CLI today. And I think um, you know the there's a whole list of of things, but the the, the highlights are you know the big the big one for me is uh, fat arrows. So like not having to bind this. That's that's inside of ES Next. That's a great, great feature. Um, and there's also things like uh, multi-line strings. There's finally multi-line strings in ES6. Uh, and so that's implemented in ES Next as well. So those kind of features are fantastic. And so check it out. Um, so again, this is something I think, uh, I think actually what we're going to see happen is Ember CLI is going to uh, start do, having uh, you know, it, I would not be very surprised. In fact, I'm going to push to have ES Next be like a default, uh, you know, add-on that's included inside of Ember CLI. And so, if you create a new Ember application, like you know we just did, you're going to be able to drop in and start using this ES6 syntax without having to do anything, right? And so, um, again, this is another thing that we can provide Ember developers that um, you know not a lot, not a lot of other uh, frameworks or libraries could without, you know, providing significant uh, configuration and, you know, without you having to do a lot of work yourself. And um, when you're getting started on a new project, that's obviously not super desirable. So, um, so let's talk a bit about the future uh, and Ember 2.0. Um, so don't worry, there's not like any huge spoilers or anything. Uh, 
But it's uh, but we actually I, I wanted to touch on it because we actually just started discussing it on the core team uh, recently, and so um, some of the things that I can say about Ember 2.0 is it's not really it's not going to be like uh, released like an Angular 2.0, which is like a complete rewrite. It's not a complete rewrite at all. Really, what I'm, well, the way that I think about Ember 2.0 is it's it's um, our ability, it, it's our first, you know, major version increment, so we can drop deprecations and um, and uh, make a bunch of other minor changes. But the big, I would say, exciting thing about Ember 2.0 is that we're going to make Ember CLI the official uh, supported way of building Ember applications. And so that means documentation on the website is going to be updated to reflect Ember CLI. You're going to see on the front the front page instead of download starter kit, you're going to see you know npm install Ember Ember right, and then, so it'll become like Ember instead of Ember CLI probably, and um, you know that'll be the way that we instruct people to build Ember applications. Um, so I guess that's a notification for if you are if you have some custom build tool system, you should probably look into uh, in the near future Ember CLI um, because the way forward is going to be. It's not going to be impossible to build Ember applications without Ember, using Ember CLI, but it's going to be the path of least resistance, right? It's going to be the way that you're going to want to, to be building your Ember applications. So, like I said, it's really about reducing file size, removing deprecations, further es 6 um, The one thing of note is that we're planning on dropping IE6 and 7 support. Um, that's part of the file size reduction. It's also nice to be able to assume um, i6 and 7 are ES3 browsers, so they're, they only support an a, a older version of JavaScript, so we're going to be able to assume a little more. We're not dropping IE8 support, um, although who knows, that might be on the chopping block, but I don't think, I think that's still, still a little too early for that. Um, but the important bit is that it, you know, the, really the, my, my, my uh, motivation for 2.0, and I think the rest of the core team agrees, is that it should be a relatively easy upgrade for 1.x one, for one users. We don't want this to be a massive undertaking for you guys to upgrade by any means. It should be very simple. It's really going to be about, if you're using old deprecated APIs, you're going to have to upgrade to the new, you know, whatever the new APIs are for that. Um, but you probably already know if you are using those deprecated APIs because they're very noisy. They tend to have a lot of like log, logging associated with them and stuff. So I think uh, it's fair, like our current projections are, we're talking probably, you know, late Q1, early Q2, 2015 uh, for Ember 2.0. Um, so, you know, we've, we're planning on, just to be clear, like we're planning on HTML bar support coming in in the 1x series, and then 2.0 will, you know, obviously include HTML bars itself, but they're not they're not related. Um, really, again, 2.0 is all about reducing cruft, um, you know, kind of giving us. Uh, you know, we've been very we've been tried to be very good about Semver compliance, so you know, we're trying to to not break any APIs across, um, you know, point releases, and so finally, with 2.0, we'll have the ability to. You know, uh, correct some of the wrongs we've we've figured out we've made over the over the years uh, or over the year, I guess I should say, uh, since 1.0. So, so yeah, uh, you know, together we're gonna I think make 2015 just as awesome as uh, 2014 has been in Emberland. So I just want to say thanks for thanks to everyone for being a part of the Ember community and uh, yeah, I'm here to answer any questions you guys might have. Any Uh, it's, it doesn't, I would say that the constraints, uh, so the question I should repeat was basically like, you're, hey, you said the way you're dealing with DOM bindings has changed. Does that affect 
your ability to actually you know, use the, uh, the dev tools in any way that you might have been already using them, right? And so uh, I think the, the answer is no, because basically there is still the same set of constraints that you would have had with the script tag based approach. Um, so I don't think anything you did with script tags is going to be much different. There's always kind of been this issue of like, you know, Ember wants to manage, and typically any you know, library or framework that's doing data binding to the DOM wants to manage all of the, the DOM manipulation because it needs to do some kind of bookkeeping. And you know, the DOM needs to basically stay in a, in a, a state uh, such that you know, the framework can come back and change it you know, again. And so I don't think you're going to have any problems with that at all. Um, it's still going to, you're still going to have uh, the issue of not being able to, you know, do too much DOM manipulation yourself without breaking, you know, the framework's data binding. So it, it shouldn't, do, you should be able to do everything you were doing before, but, you know, it's not going, it's, I don't think it will let necessarily let you get away with any more, but um, maybe it will. Uh, I haven't really thought about it too much, but, but yeah. Any other questions? So I, 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 like I said, this stuff is like really early on. I personally haven't spent a lot of time thinking through that problem. Um, the, I think there is a unfortunate situation right now uh, in the front end JavaScript world of like competing solutions to this to the distribution problem, uh, and so um, you know there there are things like there are people that use npm to deal with uh, front-end assets. There are people that use Bower. Uh, there's some new one that just came out as well. Um, that's Bower-esque. Um, but none of them are as robust as we would like them to be. NPM I, uh, is the closest uh, to, to you know, the robustness that somebody like me and uh, you know, a lot of the core team is, comes from the Ruby world. And so something like Bundler provided uh, was very robust, and we haven't really seen anything as uh, robust and stable in the JavaScript world, but we would love to see that happen. Um, so I think, you know, basically the story right now is uh, we're planning on using NPM, and we are using NPM for add-ons currently, um, but it's unclear what the future holds. Um, we're working with, uh, we've had conversations with the NPM team to, like, they, they know what features we want and, you know, what things uh, we would like to see them do. So um, it looks like it's going to be NPM, uh, but we'll see. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks. Oh, yep. Yeah. Hey. Yes. Yes, yeah. So there's basically the the so since HTML bars is going to be part of a one one point x uh, release, it has to be compatible with public APIs from the one x series, right? So um, that's the intent. So all right, thanks, guys. Thank you.